I'm supposed not to move too much, so uh, I will try to stand here because it's all on video, and if I move too much, I will move out of uh, the video uh, image. Um, so I will be a bit frozen here. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been enjoying my time here in Barcelona very much. Um, and uh, I hope that you will enjoy my talk, my presentation about my research. Um, so the presentation, it will be about bilingualism and specific language impairment. Um, and I will tell you a little bit more about the research that I've been doing together with my colleagues at Utrecht University, which is in the middle of the Netherlands. Um, the last couple of, I think we started in 2012, 2013, uh, and this is a project that will uh, continue until 2017. Uh, so I will tell you about uh, the findings we have now. Uh, some of them are very fresh, so um, it's, uh, it, it's very new results. Um, specific language impairment. So most of you will probably know what it is, but I think it's good to have uh, to start very generally to um, ensure that you all have the right information. So specific language impairment, it's uh, an impairment of language. Um, where language development falls behind. Um, it interferes, uh, what we know is that it interferes also with children's daily lives. So research has shown that children with specific language impairment, they have more difficulties with establishing relationships um, and friendships. Um, it also uh, is the case that children with specific language impairment later in life, they tend to have less opportunities compared to uh, children with a typical language development. <coughs> For instance, research uh, from my colleagues in the UK has shown that uh, adolescents with language <coughs> impairment, they are of more often unemployed, and if they are employed, they have lower paid jobs. So it is an impairment of language, but it has consequences which go much beyond language. Um, specific language impairment, it has a strong genetic component, so uh, you probably have heard that specific language impairment is something that runs in families. Um, also twin studies have for instance shown that if you have a monozygotic twin who share 100% of their genes, it's very, very, very likely that both of the twins have a specific language impairment. However, if you have a dizygotic twin uh, who share 50% of the genes, it's much, much less likely that both of them have a specific language impairment. Uh, so these are all indications that there is a strong genetic component to specific language impairments. Um, interestingly, is that there is not really a clear discernible cause for the language impairment. So children with a specific language impairment, they do not um, uh, have a hearing impairment, so the hearing is normal. So it's not the case that they have difficulties learning language because they don't hear well. They hear like other children here. Um, it's also not the case that they have lower general learning abilities, so the IQ uh, of children with a language <coughs> impairment falls within the normal range. Um, there is no frank neurological damage that could explain the language problems, and it's also not the case that these children have autism. So there is not clearly a cause for the language impairments, which make it a kind of a hidden disorder. It is hidden, but if we look at the prevalence, how frequent the disorder is, it's a very frequent disorder. So as my colleague Dorothy Bishop from the UK often says, um, it's as frequent as dyslexia, um, and it's much, much more frequent than autism. Um, all of you and many, many people in the world know what autism is. Autism is. Uh, people know what dyslexia is, um, but there are many people who do not know what a specific language impairment is probably because it's a kind of a hidden disorder. You don't notice it very well. You only notice that children have problems with language. Um, so the estimated proportion is, of percentage of children is five to seven percent of the population has a specific language impairment, which means that in an average classroom, about two children will have a specific language impairment. And if you look at the whole of Europe, uh, there are 5.8 million children or adolescents with a specific language impairment. So it's very, very frequent. Um, so this talk will be about specific language impairment. Uh, and it will also be about multilingualism or bilingualism, which is the case when it's about two languages. Uh, bilingualism or multilingualism is also very frequent. Uh, this is uh, some statistics from Europe, which show that in Europe, 
all of Europe, the majority of the people are multilingual, uh, so 45%. Uh, with 90% bilingual, 25% trilingual, and 10% of the inhabitants of Europe speak four or more languages. This is, of course, not equally distributed over Europe. It's an average. So if you look at this, uh, this map, uh, the dark blue areas are the countries with a large proportion, large percentage of multilingual speakers, um, whereas the, the light blue areas are those areas with a relatively low percentage of multilingual speakers. Um, this statistic is also based on a very general, broad definition of bilingualism, and it includes very many different forms and shapes of bilingualism, uh, because what you probably know is that um, one bilingual person is totally not comparable to another bilingual person. There are many different forms and types of bilingualism, depending on the languages, the status of the languages, the context in which you speak the languages, etc., etc. Um, I want to illustrate this, this, um, these different forms of bilingualism with two case studies. One is Amsterdam. Uh, I live, lo live close to Amsterdam. And the other one is Barcelona, uh, where we are now. If you look at Amsterdam, uh, there are a lot of cultural, mi cultural minorities. This pie chart here um, gives uh, the distribution of t children from cultural minorities on an average, in an average uh, primary school in Amsterdam. This part, the 40% are the native Dutch children. Uh, so it's 40% of the children in an average school in Amsterdam are native Dutch children, which means that 60% are cultural minority children, which at the end means that uh, in Amsterdam, in a primary school, there are only cultural minorities, because also the native uh, Dutch are a minority. Um, all those cultural minorities are children who are raised in families that migrated from other countries to the Netherlands and now live in Amsterdam. They brought with them from these countries their home languages, um, which the children learn at home from their parents, from birth often, um, and they learn Dutch as a language of the wider society and a language of school. So many of these children are kind of second language learners of Dutch because they are raised in the home language um, from birth because it's the language used in the family, for instance, Turkish, which is the largest immigrant population in the Netherlands. And then when they go to preschool or kindergarten or daycare uh, or elementary school, uh, they receive more exposure to Dutch and then they learn Dutch. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, of cultural minorities in the Netherlands uh, and a lot of kind of bilingualism, what you can call an exogenous type of bilingualism, where languages uh, are brought to the country from abroad in a way. If you turn to Barcelona, um, well, as probably all of you know, is that there is a lot of bilingualism in Barcelona, uh, but this is of a different type. It's more kind of endogenous type. Uh, it's a combination of Catalan, and Castilian, which are both languages that are um, from this area. These are in endogenous languages. Um, probably nearly all people in Barcelona uh, and the larger Barcelona area are bilingual. Uh, that's what these statistics here show. There are somewhat more people who feel that uh, Castilian is the first language uh, than Catalan, but there are many people who also feel that Catalan is the first language. Um, nearly all people understand uh, both languages, Catalan and Castilian. Uh, the large majority also is able to speak both languages. And there are also many people who can write both languages, which indicates um, that there is fairly balanced bilingualism. Uh, and there are a large number of people here that are, have a good command of both languages, Catalan and Castilian. In addition to this, um, <coughs> There are a lot of immigrants too, so there is a combination of endogenous um, bilingualism and exogenous bilingualism, because all these immigrants, um, they also bring with them their home languages, uh, and then maybe these children speak at home uh, Pakistani, a Pakistani language, uh, and then in the wider uh, society, they learn Castilian and uh, Catalan also. What I want to do today is look at a combination of specific language impairment, which is a child internal factor, uh, 
so uh, what I mean, what I uh, want to say with this is that it's a genetic factor. So a child is born with specific language impairment. It's a child internal factor. Uh, I want to look at this factor, the impact of this factor on the language development of children uh, in combination or an interplay or an interaction with an external factor, bilingualism. So a child um, uh, becomes bilingual because of the environment. So if the languages are spoken in the environment, then a child becomes bilingual. So it is an external factor. Um, and I, what I want to do is I want to look at the interaction between this child internal factor, a specific language impairment, and this child external factor, bilingualism. And it's important to do so because there is a large number of children who are both bilingual and have a specific language impairment. And we don't know much about this population. Um, the aim of this talk is twofold. So there is a more or less a theoretical aim. Um, so what I want to do, I want to look at the effects of the combined effect of bilingualism and specific <coughs> language impairment. So are these two, do these two conditions have separate effects, separate symptoms, or do they have similar symptoms? And if they have similar symptoms, do they add up? So do children who are both bilingual and have a specific language impairment have a kind of a double delay, double problem? Uh, when they learn language. Or what might also be the case, uh, might the bilingualism be a kind of sort of therapy? Uh, I do not mean to say it's a real therapy, but it, if you're bilingual, you have kind of more resources, social resources, cognitive resources. Um, and it might be the case that those resources kind of um, help children with specific language impairment. So maybe in bilingual children, the effects of specific language <coughs> impairment are less pronounced compared to monolingual children. So that's one thing I want to do today. The uh, second one is uh, look at more clinical issues. Uh, so how can we tease, so if you have to diagnose a bilingual ch child, it can be difficult to uh, decide whether problems with language are related to bilingualism or specific language impairment. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about too is how can we tease the symptoms of SLI and bilingualism apart and how can we at the end prevent over and under diagnosis of bilingual children. Um, I will address these two issues um, based on data that we collected in, uh, in the project I, I told you about. Um, the project is called Cognitive Development in the Context of Emerging Bilingualism, <coughs> Cultural Minority Children in the Netherlands. It's funded by the Dutch scientific, the organization that, organization that funds scientific research in the Netherlands, the NWO. Um, it's carried out at Utrecht University together with my colleagues uh, and a lot of, so we're working with a lot of assistants and we collaborate with schools and with clinicians. But there is a core team of researchers uh, who are those five people. Uh, my two PhD students, Mona Timmermeister and Tessel Boerma. And the work I will present today uh, will be part of the doctoral dissertation of Tessel Boerma. Um, so they did a lot of work for this research. And uh, I'm collaborating with Frank Wijn, who is a professor of psycholinguistics at Utrecht University, and Paul Leesman, who is a professor uh, in the special education department at Utrecht University. Okay, the first part, part will be about the theoretical issues. Um, in order to kind of uh, predict what will happen if you combine bilingualism and specific language impairment, I think it's important to look a little bit more closely at the specific symptoms of specific language impairment. Uh, so what we know about specific language impairment is uh, that it's a heterogeneous disorder. Uh, the impairment effects can affect different aspects of language. Uh, so there are children who have more difficulties with phonology, there are children who have more difficulties with word finding, finding the right word on time, uh, in real time. Um, there are children uh, who have also speech problems, for instance. But uh, what is kind of very typical is that children with specific language impairment have difficulties with grammar. Um, so this is a typical profile, grammar, and then there might be other problems as well. Um, the problems uh, are mostly in production, but there are also children who have problems with comprehension. Usually the children who have both problems with comprehension and production are those children who have a severe, more severe form of the impairment. <coughs> so there is al also heterogeneity in terms of severity. There are children who have uh, 
a very severe form of specific language impairment and there are children who have a weak form of specific language impairment. And at the end, we're talking about a continuum uh, from children who are very proficient in language to children who are very unproficient in language. And we somehow make somewhere an arbitrary cutoff uh, in order to assign these children a diagnostic label, but it is arbitrary at the end. Um, so grammar is typically affected. Uh, this example here, it's from a book of Dorothy Bishop, and it's, yeah, you can see it. It's an example um, from a boy who was telling a story, and what you see here is that he makes an error uh, with the case marking of the subject, so instead of he, the child, the boy says uh, him. Um, and instead of said, because it should be past tense, uh, the child <coughs> says say, so uses a bare verb stem. Instead of um, jumped, so the past tense ed, uh, the child says jump, again a bare verb stem, and instead of smashed, the child says smash. So uh, difficulties with case marking and difficulties with using uh, past tense, uh, the rule for past tense formation in English. Um, these errors are very common in, in typically developing children as well. Uh, however, this boy is eight years old, and for typically developing children, these errors are common at the age of two. So what this clearly shows is a very delayed pattern of language development. If we look across languages, um, so also in, in Spanish, um, I'm not an expert uh, on Spanish specific language impairment, but what I know about Spanish is that children with specific language impairment who learn Spanish also have difficulties uh, with, for instance, uh, verb inflection. Clitics are very difficult, difficult. pronouns are difficult. Um, so what you see across languages is that grammar is difficult and it depends a little bit on the properties of a specific language, which area of grammar is affected. Um, another example to show that grammar is affected um, are these graphs. These are taken from the work of Mabel Rice, uh, who is also a very famous researcher in the field of specific language impairment. Um, these are de developmental curves. So on the x-axis you see the age of the children, and on the y-axis, um, in this graph it's a grammar score, it's a finiteness composite, it's a composite score for the third person singular S in English and the past tense ED, production, and it's the percentage correct use of these grammatical forms. Um, this graph gives the PPVT score, it's a Peabody picture vocabulary task, it's a receptive vocabulary task. So that one is grammar, that one is vocabulary. If you look at the age of four, so that's where I put the red uh, line, uh, what you see is that for grammar, there's a huge gap between the typically developing children, which are the continuous lines, the dotted lines are the children with specific language impairment. There is a huge gap in performance. So a four-year-old child um, with specific language impairment tends to use um, third-person singular S and past tense ED about 10% of the times, whereas a four-year-old typically developing child does so more than 80% of the times. So there is a huge gap. There is, um, what this shows is that uh, this part of grammar is severely affected. And the gap is much larger if you look at vocabulary. Um, what you can see here in this graph is that when the children grow older, the children with specific language impairment, they catch up with respect to grammar. So if you look at the age of eight, for instance, uh, the kids with specific language impairment are able to use these grammatical forms, third person singular S and past tense ED, uh, so they manage to acquire this rule. However, at this age, there are other, more complex rules of grammar that uh, have become a problem. For instance, what we know is that relative clauses, uh, relative object clauses, um, are, which are kind of complex, um, syntactically complex sentences, uh, are very difficult for all the children with specific language impairments. So the profile of specific language impairment also changes with age. At later ages, the simple rules, they acquire them, but the more complex rules remain uh, complicated. What we also know is that children, at, when they get older, they are very well able to kind of avoid the complex rules. Uh, so you often don't notice the impairment that much because they have all kinds of strategies to cope uh, with their problem. Um, 
So there is a kind of a dissociation or a difference between how well Tillman-specific language impairment are able to acquire grammar and uh, vocabulary. <coughs> grammar is a real problem and vocabulary is not so much of a problem. You also see this reflected in um, morphology, regular versus irregular morphology. Irregular morphology is like learning vocabulary in a way. You have to memorize uh, all those forms because they're not really rules uh, that predict uh, what the form looks like. Uh, so for instance, uh, the, the right wrote, it's irregular morphology in English um, and uh, it's not really predictable that it's wrote. Um, so you have to memorize all these forms, like learning vocabulary. Regular morphology, uh, it's predictable. So once you've learned the rule stem plus ed is past tense, you can use, can apply this rule to all kinds of new forms. So that's a rule of grammar. Um, if we look uh, between groups, typically developing children and children with specific language impairment, what research has shown um, is that children with specific language impairment with respect to regular morphology, so grammar, um, they perform below age matches, uh, typically developing age matches, so children of the same age with a typical development, but they also perform uh, lower than language matched, typically developing children. So younger children who kind of uh, make sentences, also shorter sentences, so they are language matched, so in terms of language level, they are comparable <coughs> to the children with specific language impairment, uh, but with respect to this past tense marking, regular morphology, they even perform lower than those children. So what some researchers say about this, about the past tense uh, marking in English, that's a kind of a delay within a delay. Um, however, if you look at irregular past tense, uh, and compare typically developing children with children with specific language impairment, <coughs> studies have found no differences between the two groups. Um, studies have also looked within the groups uh, and compared performance on regulars and irregulars, and these studies have shown that typically developing children are clearly better at regular morphology than irregular morphology, but in children with SLI there is no differences between regulars and irregulars, so they perform equally well on regular morphology compared to irregular morphology. So this seems also compatible with the difference between <coughs> grammar and vocabulary because irregular morphology has to be learned like vocabulary um, and regular morphology, it's a rule of grammar. <coughs> um, so in order to explain this kind of pattern, uh, researchers have argued that children with specific language impairment have a kind of procedural deficit. So they have difficulties learning procedures. Um, the idea behind, the rationale behind this uh, hypothesis or explanation is that grammar is subserved by procedural memory, which is part of long-term memory, whereas vocabulary, where you have to memorize information, um, and that includes, uh, that, so vocabulary is subserved by declarative memory, so and this includes also irregular morphology. So what might be the case is that children um, with specific language impairment, they might have difficulty with this procedural learning, using this procedural memory. In addition to problems with procedural memory, uh, it has been found that children, children with specific language impairment have processing limitations, so limitations uh, in processing information. Uh, many studies have shown that children with specific language impairment, uh, they have less uh, verbal short-term memory capacity. So the verbal short-term memory, you use it to kind of temporarily store information that comes in, um, verbal information. Um, Children with specific language impairment also have difficulties with uh, verbal working memory. So you use your verbal working memory when you not only store information, but also manipulate information, do something with the information. Um, children with specific language impairment, they have difficulties with executive control mechanisms, specifically with inhibition and planning. Um, and children with specific language impairment have a slower speed of processing. So they have processing speed difficulties. So there are all kinds of different processing limitations in children with SLI. If we combine these two hypotheses or explanations uh, for SLI or uh, things that patterns that have been observed, we arrive at the following list of predictions. Um, so uh, about where you find an effect of SLI. Um, the idea that procedural memory is affected by SLI predicts that children with SLI um, 
that they will not have so many difficulties learning vocabulary, so there will not really be an SLI effect with respect to vocabulary. I've put a question mark here as well because there are studies that have found that children with SLI do have some difficulties learning vocabulary. But this is not predicted by the procedural deficit hypothesis uh, because in terms of declarative memory, which subserves learning vocabulary, um, children with SLI do not have a problem. It's only a procedural problem. problem. So, uh, given this hypothesis, you would also expect no effect for SLI uh, for regular morphology. Um, for regular morphology, you do expect a negative effect. So, children with SLI will perform lower than typically developing peers. And uh, given the processing limitations we know about, we expect that children with SLI um, perform lower than typically developing peers, both with respect to verbal short-term memory and verbal working memory. Okay, so that's uh, some background on specific language impairment and the predictions that we started out with. Now I turn to uh, bilingualism and language delays. Um, I assume or that you are all maybe kind of familiar with usage-based theory, um, which is a theory um, <coughs> in psycholinguistics um, that assigns an important role to the, role to the input of children. So basically what this theory says is that each input token so each token in the input strengthens linguistics rep linguistic rep representations in long-term memory. So the more often you hear a word, the stronger your linguistic representation in your long-term memory will be, and the earlier you will acquire this form. So input frequency is very important in um, this theory, and there are also many studies that have shown that input frequency uh, really affects um, uh, language acquisition. If you look at the input situation of bilingual children, um, it is kind of simplistic, but what you can assume is that these children have to kind of divide um, their input, the total amount of input, over two languages, which means that in both of the languages, they have less input compared to a monolingual child. Also, if you look at sequential bilingual children, they start at a somewhat later age compared to monolingual children, which, me which means that they have a shorter um, a length of exposure. They have been exposed to the language for a shorter period of time. So, what this at the end means is that bilingual children have less experience, less input compared to monolingual children, and uh, this will lead to language delays. Um, this will not hold true for all bilingual children because there are also studies that have shown that bilingual children have no delays, but it depends very much on the input situation. So, in a very balanced situation, uh, where children receive many, much input in both their languages, the chances that there are delays uh, are much smaller than in a very kind of unbalanced situation, for instance. Um, there are uh, some studies that indeed have shown that there are delays in bilingual children. For instance, the study by Hoff et al. 2012 has looked at toddlers, so young children, and has, looked at the, has compared the bilingual children with monolingual children, uh, both on vocabulary and on grammar, mean length of utterance, and this study has shown that there are delays in these children in both vocabulary and in grammar. Uh, and this probably is due to the amount of input that these children receive um, in, in the language, which is less than a monolingual child receives. Um, on the other hand, uh, other studies have shown that there are also areas of cognition where bilingual children have an advantage, and they are ahead of monolingual children. Um, so there is bilingual cognitive enhancement. What these studies have shown is that bilingual children, they outperform monolingual children on tasks that look at executive functions. So what are the executive functions? These are functions that you use to kind of um, achieve your goal, uh, to, so to perform goal-directed behavior, uh, to do multitasking, to ignore distraction, to uh, achieve what you want to achieve to plan your day. To, so in all kind of daily activities, you use your executive functions to achieve what you want to achieve. Um, inhibition, switching, and working memory are three uh, main executive <coughs> functions that you often find in literature. Uh, so bilingual children, what research has shown is that, for instance, five-year-old bilingual children, they, with respect to inhibition, they perform like six-year-old six year monolingual children. So they are one year ahead um, of monolingual children with respect to inhibition and inhibitory control. Um, so on the one hand, bilingual children may have certain delays compared to, to monolinguals, but uh, if you look at cognition, executive functions, 
uh, they have advantages. They are ahead of monolinguals. Um, there is some discussion, some debate about uh, where these advantages come from, where this enhancement comes from. But the general idea is that bilingual children, they, uh, so what we know is that in bilinguals, both languages are active always at the brain level. Uh, so bilingual children, they have to man manage and monitor these two languages the whole time. Um, they have to, to look for cues, which language to use. They have to decide on which language to use. And in deciding which language to use, they have to inhibit one language and they have to use another language. And this is a continuous process the whole time. So it's kind of continuous training of the executive functions. Um, so uh, that might lead, it's thought that that leads to the cognitive enhancement of bilingual children. Um, these are data from a study I did together with my colleagues. Um, and it was a study on Turkish-Dutch bilingual children. Uh, and we compared them to monolingual Dutch children. We followed the children for two years. So we tested them at the age of five and at the age of six. Um, we had a number of language measures, both in the first language, the bilinguals, Turkish, and the second language, Dutch. Uh, and we had working memory measures. Um, we had a, a number of different working memory measures, but the, uh, the backward digit spend task, which is a verbal working memory task, showed at the age of six a clear advantage for the bilingual children. <coughs> so in this task, what the children need to do, it's a complex task. They um, hear a sequence of digits, and they have to repeat the digits in the reverse order. It starts with one digit. Well, you don't, cannot <coughs> reverse the order. But then it's two digits, uh, and they have to reverse the order, and it goes up until seven digits, which is kind of complex. Um, so the bilingual children at the age of six clearly outperformed with a, with a good effect size uh, the monolingual children on this task. Uh, and we also find a found a bilingual <coughs> advantage on a visual spatial working memory test, the dot matrix test, where the children had to remember um, the location of a dot in a matrix. Uh, it began also, again, with one dot, and then there were two dots that they had to a sequence of two dots on different locations that they had to remember, <coughs> three, four, five, six, <coughs> and so on. Uh, so in these two tasks, we found um, an effect of bilingualism, a positive effect of bilingualism. Uh, interestingly, it was not there at the age of five, so it was an interaction between group and age. It was there at the age of six. And what we think, so if you look at the language development of the bilingual children, uh, if you compare their language scores at the age of uh, five and six, it turns out that both in their Dutch and in their Turkish, they develop, so they become more proficient bilinguals. Um, these children come to a Dutch school at the age of four, <coughs> then they are often dominant Turkish, and their Dutch is very low. Um, at the age of six, they are kind of more balanced bilinguals, and it was also indicated by their language <coughs> scores. So it might be an effect of um, more experience uh, with being bilingual, uh, more experience with managing the two languages, switching between the two languages, and more bilingual proficiency. Um, okay, if we now look at the predictions for if, you, if we combine uh, the effects of specific language impairment and of bilingualism, um, we arrive at, so if we look at bilingualism only, we just looked at specific language impairment. If we now look at bilingualism, we expect a negative effect of bilingualism on all those measures um, that look at language knowledge in a way, uh, so that are affected by experience and input. Uh, so we expect a negative effect of bilingualism for vocabulary, for irregular morphology, and for regular morphology. Um, we expect um, maybe a positive effect for verbal working memory, uh, I'm not sure what we expect for verbal short-term memory. There are studies that found no effects. There are also studies that find some negative effects of bilingualism or verbal short-term memory because it's kind of dependent on your long-term memory, on your experience. However, verbal working memory, it's not very much dependent on your language experience. So, um, uh, and our studies show that a clearly positive effect of bilingualism. But I put a question mark here because I know that there are also studies that did not find a positive effect of bilingualism for verbal working memory. So there are different results in different studies. So if you now combine uh, the effects of the expected predicted effects of specific language impairment with those of bilingualism, um, we might affect a kind of double delay with respect to 
knowledge-based measures, uh, particularly for regular morphology, given the idea that regular morphology is severely affected by specific language impairment. Uh, we also expect negative effect of bilingualism, so these two may add up and there might be a double delay. Um, with respect to verbal working memory, it might be the case that bilingualism has a kind of positive effect and makes the effects of specific language impairment less uh, in bilingual children compared to monolingual children. So this is kind of roughly what we expect uh, for bilingual children with specific language impairment. And this is what we wanted to test in our sample with bilingual children with specific language impairment. So the questions that we asked were the following. The first one, do measures of language knowledge, so vocabulary, irregular morphology, uh, regular morphology, show a double delay in bilingual SLI? And is this effect larger for grammar, procedural memory, than for vocabulary, declarative memory? That was the first question. The second question was, is bilingualism a kind of therapy for SLI with respect to measures of processing, particularly verbal working memory? Um, we had, uh, we, in order to, to kind of test uh, these predictions and address these questions, we tested five and six-year-old children, 120 children. Um, these children were drawn from a larger database. Uh, we made it smaller groups uh, because we wanted to match the children, so the groups are matched on age and on verbal IQ. And there are 30 children in each group, and the groups are uh, children, monolingual children with a typical language development, so TD. Um, the other group had monolingual children with a language impairment. Then there was a group of 30 children bilingual with a typical development and 30 children bilingual with a language impairment. So four groups, 30 children in each group. With respect to the first languages of the bilingual children, it was the case that uh, in the typically developing sample, these were all Turkish or Moroccan uh, speaking children who learned Dutch as their second, lang second language. In the language impaired group, it was a mixture. Uh, we first wanted to control for first language, but we also wanted to have a kind of substantial sample of children. So we gave up on the controlling for first language and it's a mixture of languages. The following measures were used. So we used the Peabody picture vocabulary task for septic vocabulary. We used the Taaltoets alle Kindre, the language test for all children. Um, for ex there's a subtest uh, that looks at expressive morphology, uh, past participle formation and noun plurals, regular and irregular. So we use this subtest. Um, for verbal short-term memory, we use the simple digit span task, so a forward task, where children only have to store the information and repeat the digits in the same order as they heard them. And we use the more complex task, so the digit span backward, backwards task to test verbal working memory. Um, these are the data, uh, and I realize that, well, this may be a bit small, but uh, the blue bars are, are the monolinguals, the green bars are the bilinguals. These are typically developing children, monolingual typically developing children. These are monolingual children with a language impairment. These are bilingual children with a typical development, and these are bilingual children with a language impairment. Um, if you look at the results, it turns out that um, there were both negative effects of language impairment and bilingualism. So children with a language impairment overall, so regardless of monolingual or bilingual, had a lower vocabulary compared to typically developing children. And it was also the case that bilingual children, regardless of being typically developing or uh, language impairment, scored lower than monolingual children. So there are negative effects of both, which we expected on beforehand. Uh, with respect to address the issue of the double delay, it's relevant to compare the monolingual group with language impairment and a bilingual group with language impairment. Um, because if, you, if there is a double delay, you would expect that the bilingual children with a language impairment perform lower than the monolingual children with a language impairment. And this is indeed what we found for vocabulary. So the monolingual children with a language impairment perform better had a larger vocabulary than the bilingual children with a language impairment. These are the data for the morphology. So this is the regular morphology. These are the irregular forms. This is again monolingual typical development, monolingual language impairment, bilingual typical, de typical development, bilingual language impairment. And it's the same here. 
like vocabulary, these data also showed a negative effect of both language impairment and bilingualism. However, if we compare, uh, when we compared the bilingual language impaired group with the monolingual language impaired group, there was not a statistical significant difference. So there was statistically speaking, not evidence, no evidence for a double delay with respect to irregular morphology and regular morphology. Um, what you notice here with respect to irregular morphology, um, the monolingual language impaired group, the bilingual typically developing children, as well as the bilingual language impaired group had all much difficult, many difficulties with irregular forms. So um, that might show the floor performance, especially in the language impaired groups, might also be a reason why there was no effect. So there was kind of floor performance. These are the data for the processing measures, so verbal short-term memory and verbal working memory. That's verbal short-term memory, and this is verbal working memory. Um, what these data showed when we analyzed them was no effect of bilingualism. So the, on these tasks, the bilingual children had the same performance as the monolingual children, but there was a clear effect of language impairment. So children with the language impairment, they were outperformed by their typically developing peers on these processing measures, which we expected. Um, we also ran analyses with covariates. Uh, so what we did, because these tasks are, they require relatively little language, but they require some, may require some language, because you have to know about the digits in a language, for instance. And the bilingual children, their language knowledge of Dutch was lower uh, compared to the monolinguals. So we run the same analyses with uh, language measures in Dutch as a covariate. So we controlled statistically for level of language. And we, when we did this, it turned out that the bilingual children outperformed the monolingual children on these processing tasks. So there was, when you control for level of language that was used in the test, so Dutch, uh, then it turned out that the bilingual children performed better on these tasks compared to the monolingual children. So a bilingual advantage. Okay, to summarize these results, uh, what these data show was a double delay for vocabulary, which we expected. Um, no double delay for grammar. Um, it might be the case, so this might kind of go against the procedural deficit hypothesis, uh, but it might also be the case that vocabulary is kind of more affected by the input than grammar. Uh, if you think about grammar, you need input for a while, but once you have acquired a rule, you don't need any input anymore because then you can use this rule and you don't need new input to learn the rule better. You, at one point you just know it. When you know that past tense is formed with a past tense ED, then you can, can apply this rule to all kind of new forms. With respect to vocabulary, there's kind of a moving target. So you're never finished with learning vocabulary. Uh, so you keep on needing input when you learn vocabulary. Uh, so at the end it might be the case that for vocabulary learning, input is more important than for grammar learning. And that might explain why there is a double delay with respect to vocabulary and not with respect um, to grammar. Um, and the last issue was um, what the, work, the working memory measures verbal short-term memory. Uh, these data showed indications of kind of protective mechanisms in the domain of verbal processing. Uh, so the bilingual children, when we controlled for language level, the bilingual children performed better than the monolingual children. Um, we also looked more specifically within the groups. So in this analysis, we uh, collapsed the, um, we grouped the typically developing children and the language impaired children together. We also compared, for instance, bilingual children with a language impairment and uh, monolingual children with a language impairment. Um, there were numerical differences. So the bilingual children performed better, but these differences were not statistically significant. So maybe it's the case when you have a larger sample, they might be statistically significant. <coughs> okay, so this is the, the first part of the talk uh, about the separate effects, similar effects, double delay therapy issue. Um, now I want to move to the second part of the talk, which, is, which has a kind of different focus, namely it's on clinical issues. So how can we tease the symptoms of SLI and bilingualism apart? Uh, and how can we prevent over and under diagnosis of bilingual children? Um, so it can be very difficult to tease apart the effects of bilingualism and SLI. And if we go, 
um, let me look. For instance, um, yeah, both. If you look at vocabulary, <coughs> if you compare monolingual children with a language impairment to bilingual children with a typical development, what we see here is that they show equal performance in terms of accuracy. So they're very similar. If we look at regular morphology, it's again very similar. So the profiles of a monolingual child with a language impairment and a bilingual child with a typical development can, in terms of accuracy, can be very, very similar. Um, and what you can imagine, if these profiles are so similar, it's very difficult to tell or not whether a bilingual child has SLI or not, because the, <coughs> the profiles are so similar. Um, so it can be very difficult to tease apart whether a child has a language delay due to external factors, not having had enough input, or a language disorder, which is caused by genetic child internal factors. Um, what these statistics show, these are graphs from um, the, the uh, representation of the percentage of cultural minority children in the Netherlands in regular education, which is in blue, and in special education for children with speech and language problems, um, <coughs> which are in green. What you see is that the green bars are higher than the blue bars, which indicates that there is an overrepresentation of cultural minority children, and specifically Moroccan and Turkish speaking children, in special education. And you would not expect such an overrepresentation because uh, SLI is genetic, and you would not, there's no reason to expect that there are relatively more bilingual children with SLI than monolingual children with SLI. You would expect the same frequency in both populations. This indicates an overrepresentation. It might have to do with not having the right tools to diagnose bilingual children um, and to, to recognize, identify the specific language impairment in these children. So what this indicates is that there are, in special education, uh, probably too many bilingual children, and there are probably children who do not have a specific language impairment at all. Uh, on the other hand, it might also be, and it will probably be the case, that in regular education, there are children who have specific language impairment, are bilingual, but not recognized. So there is both um, kind of mistaken identity, bilingual children who do not have a language impairment, but are diagnosed with a language impairment, and there are missed identities. So bilingual children who have a language impairment, but the language impairment is not recognized. This is an issue not only in the Netherlands, uh, it's an issue in the whole world. So in America and the US, there are researchers busy with uh, improving the tools. Uh, in Canada, there are people busy with this issue. Uh, and also in Europe, uh, there are people have been very busy with this issue. Uh, there has been a large European cost action which is funded by the European Commission, and it ran between 2008, I think, and 2011, for three years, and uh, in this project participated about 35 research teams all over Europe. Um, they came together twice a year with the purpose, with the aim, to develop new diagnostic tools that are relevant for diagnosing bilingual <coughs> children, because it's an issue in many European countries. Uh, because in many countries there are a lot of bilingual, multilingual speakers, as we've seen. Um, when I started my big research project, it was 2012, and at that point those new instruments were just developed. So for me it was a very nice opportunity to kind of take these tools and test them out how they worked. Uh, so what I will do in this presentation is um, tell a little bit more about two instruments that have been developed within this cost action. Um, a quasi-universal non-word repetition task and a narrative task. And I will start with a quasi-universal non-word repetition task which has been developed by a group of people led by Shula Chayat from, uh, from London. And if you look, for instance, at the internet and you look at Bisley, B-I-S-L-I, uh, you will definitely find the website of this big project with information on it. And just, I think it was in May, there was a book released, published, uh, with chapters on all of these methods that have been developed. So you can buy it now online. Um, the non repetition task. So a non repetition task, uh, it's a measure of verbal short-term memory. Um, it has been argued by people that it's a promising tool for diagnosing bilingual children. Uh, first of all, because it's highly sensitive to SLI. Uh, so people even say that it's a kind of clinical marker for SLI. 
Um, secondly, because it's kind of culturally non-biased, uh, which makes it appropriate for bilingual children. Um, and what studies have also shown is that it's a processing measure uh, and it's, for instance, much less affected by experience with a specific language compared with, for instance, uh, vocabulary tasks. However, it's uh, less biased. Um, it re requires less experience with a specific language compared to a vocabulary task, but it's not completely unbiased. So uh, what we know from studies is that children um, who have a larger vocabulary uh, in a certain language are also better able to do a, a non-much repetition task in that language. So it's not entirely independent <coughs> of your knowledge of a specific language. Um, so uh, it is still a kind of biased um, way to assess bilingual children. Um, and what Shula Chayad has proposed is that there might be a solution to this problem, and that is to design a non word repetition task that is kind of quasi-universal, that is as language unspecific as possible. Um, so it kind of um, combines those features of languages that are shared by most languages in the world. So it's not specific to a specific language, uh, which means that it also doesn't require experience with a specific language. It requires experience with language, but not a specific language. So how does this tool look like? What does it look like? Um, well, the test we use, it has 16 items uh, with two, three, four, or five syllables. Uh, so they were different, different in length. Um, the items were compatible with cross-linguistically diverse constraints of lexical phonology, which means that they contain those phonemes, those sounds, that are common in most languages of the world. Uh, and the prosody was kind of neutral. It had a kind of falling prosody, which is, if you look uh, typologically at different languages, it's the prosody that is most common in, uh, in languages across the world. So we, um, we used this instrument to test the children, the four groups of children, and we co compared it with a language-specific non word repetition task. So most non word repetition tasks that we have and that are part of standardized assessments are language-specific, so they are still follow the kind of phonotactic, phonological constraints of a specific language. Um, and we compared the, non the quasi-universal non word repetition task with a language-specific non word repetition task based on a task developed by by Judith Rispens and, and Baker. And I now would like to um, illustrate the task with a small sample of a child, and I hope it works. Let me see. <coughs> so what you will hear is a child with specific language impairment who is doing the test, uh, and this child will um, hear item, and I don't, I'm not sure, I think, Ah, I'm not going to tell you. So they, the child will hear both, will both do the language specific task and the quasi universal <coughs> task. And after the fragment, I will ask you uh, what the order was, whether the quasi universal task was the first one or the language specific task was the first one. And I hope it works. Likovu par. Likovu par. Moeilijke woordjes zijn het, hè? Ve YouTube. Kofiwalan. Kofiwalan. Ranom. Raon. Gewezoegeer. Danes. Danes. Liotanig. Peonagig. Ja, nu je uit Fugewuinufeb. Ik ga vuilnpap. Moeilijk, hè? Ja. Kuimup. Kuimup. Wokalumodon. Ook een poelampon. Ja, je doet het echt supergoed. Pamudi. Pamupuki. Zibalita. Zibalita. Lita. Lita. Tulika sumu. Kukane suni. Naki. Naki. Liti saku. Ike saku. 
Malu Zikuba. Malu Zikuba. Okay, what do you think? Was the first part language specific or the second part language specific? So raise your arms. Who thinks that the first part was language specific? You think the first part and the rest think that the second part was language specific? Well, you were right. You were a minority. <laughs> <laughs> so the first part of the test was language specific. Uh, the second part was the quasi-universal task. Uh, you can notice it in the falling prosody. So the second part had this kind of falling da 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 falling prosody. Uh, also, it had only C V C V C V syllables, consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant <coughs> vowel, which is uh, a kind of syllable structure which is uh, shared by all languages in the world. Um, whereas the first the Dutch specific uh, um, test, it had also C V C syllables. It had diphthongs. Uh, so it is a more complex task. Um, but just to illustrate uh, what the task sounds like. And it's a task that is difficult for children with specific language impairment. So you notice that the child had, specific, especially with the longer words, many difficulties with pronouncing, uh, remembering the words. And what we typically do in those tasks is we just count the phonemes correct or the words correct, uh, because that gives you an indication of how many verbal information, phonological information a child can store in a verbal short-term memory. So these are the results from the four groups of children. Um, so here, it's different from the other graphs I, I showed you. Here, the dotted lines are the typically developing children, and the continuous lines are the children uh, with language impairment. The blue lines are the monolingual children, and the green lines are the bilingual children. On the right-hand side is quasi-universal test, and here is the language-specific test. What you see is that for both tests, um, so the number of syllables is on the x-axis, the number of the percentage of phonemes correct is on the y-axis, uh, which you can see in both tasks as the words are longer, more syllables, uh, the children have more difficulties. That's what you would expect. That's what other studies find as well. Um, in addition, what these data show, so if you compare uh, the continuous lines with the dotted lines, you see that the continuous lines are much lower than the dotted lines, which indicates that the children with language impairment, the continuous lines, have more problems, perform lower on both tasks. So there was a clear effect of language impairment on both the quasi-universal and the language-specific uh, normative repetition task. Um, if you compare the blue and the green, what you see is that for the quasi-universal, the blues <coughs> and the greens are very close together. Uh, so there was no effect of bilingualism. Bilingual children performed equally well on this task compared to the monolingual children on the quasi-universal test. If you look at the language-specific test, there is a difference, especially in the typically developing group. There was a clear, large effect of bilingualism with the bilingual children having more difficulties with this task than the monolingual children. These are group data, uh, which are interesting. So they tell you something about the effect of language impairment, and they tell you something about the effect of bilingualism. Um, however, what you really want to know if you're a clinician or a speech-language therapist is whether you can use this measure to diagnose individual children. So what is the diagnostic accuracy, the diagnostic value of this test? Um, and in order to, to look at this, you look at the sensitivity and the specificity. So the sense I always... Uh, I'm confused, I I'm, I'm, I'm never know what sensitivity is, specificity is, so that's why I used, uh, have the definition here. The sensitivity is the proportion of children that are diagnosed with a language impairment and that are identified as such by the instrument. The specificity is the proportion of children with typical development that are also identified by the instrument as having a typical development. And of course, you want to have both the sensitivity and the specificity as high as possible. Uh, because then you're kind of diagnosing, giving the right children the right diagnostic label. Um, there are criteria for, for sensitivity and specificity. Uh, if it's below 80%, it's unacceptable. It's too low. If it's between 80 and uh, 98%, um, it's a fair uh, diagnostic value. If it's above 90%, it's good. <laughs> 
Um, here are the sensitivity and specificity for the monolingual children. What you see is that for the monolingual children, um, the language-specific number of repetition tests um, has a better diagnostic accuracy, diagnostic value, compared to the quasi-universal number of repetition tests. So for the language-specific test in a mon monolingual group, uh, the sensitivity and the specificity are both above 90%, which is good. Uh, for the quasi-universal test, um, the sensitivity and specificity are 83 for the sensitivity and 90% for the specificity. So this is in the monolingual sample. These are the data for the bilingual sample. What these data show is that for the quasi-universal test, um, the sensitivity is fair, the specificity is good. If you look at the language-specific number of repetition task, uh, for the bilingual children, the sensitivity is really unacceptable. So it has a very low sensitivity, uh, which means that there are many children in the sample, um, in the bilingual sample, who are, according to the instrument, uh, have a language impairment, but in fact they do not have a language impairment. So that is over-diagnosis. Uh, and the specificity of the language-specific uh, test is good. So, summarizing for the bilingual children, um, the quasi-universal test is much better, uh, has a much better diagnostic value than a language-specific uh, normal repetition test. <coughs> so that's the, the quasi-universal normal repetition test. Um, now I want to continue with, uh, with a second, a very different type of assessment, which is a narrative test, uh, the multilingual assessment instrument for narratives. Um, also developed by a group of people, and Natalia Gagarina, she was, she's in Berlin, she was one of the leaders of this group. So if you look at narrative skills, um, uh, narratives uh, are a very um, kind of uh, rich instrument. They tell you a lot about what a child can do. Uh, it's, a complex, it's a complex task to tell a narrative. Uh, you have to plan your story. Um, you have to, to do many things at the same time. It's a complex task. It gives you rich data about what a child can do at different levels. So if you look at the literature on narratives, what studies often do is they distinguish between a macro level, which is the story level, um, and a micro level, which is the sentence level. It's a more fine-grained level. So the macro structure looks, for instance, at the basic event structure, the plot structure of a story. So if a child tells a story, does, does she um, explain about the goal of a character, about the attempts of a character to reach the goal, <coughs> and about the outcomes of the attempts to reach the goal? Uh, does it only specify a goal or only an outcome? Or does a child use the whole sequence to tell about an event? Um, so that's a macro structure me a measure. Uh, also a macro structure measure is uh, whether or not children talk about internal states of characters in a story. Um, and a macro measure is also whether children are able to make inferences based on a whole story. Microstructure measures uh, are measures, for instance, uh, which have to do with the words that children use, the length of the sentences, whether or not they use referential express expressions, for instance. So but that's at a much finer grained level, the sentence level. Um, if you look at specific language impairment, um, there have been quite some studies that have looked at narratives. Uh, most of these studies tend to find negative effects. So children with specific language impairment, they have more difficulties with narratives compared to typically developing children. However, there is also variation between studies. So there are studies that find no differences in terms of narratives between children with specific language impairment and children with typical development. Um, and there are also studies that find a lot of variation. So some children who have difficulties with narratives and other children with SLI who do not have difficulties with narratives. Uh, but most studies seem to find negative effects, both for macrostructure and for microstructure. If you look at bilingualism, um, then the studies tend to find no differences between monolinguals and bilinguals for macrostructure. Um, because uh, macrostructure, it's not really dependent on knowledge of a specific language. If you know how to tell a story in your first language, you probably also know how to tell a story in a second language. And maybe your story is very short, 
But if you use the right elements, it's still a complex story in terms of story grammar. Um, so uh, studies tend to find no differences between monolinguals and bilinguals for macrostructure, but they find weaker performance for bilinguals and microstructure. So shorter sentences, uh, less different words, for instance. This combination, a negative effect of specific, specific, specific language impairments, so sensitivities to specific language impairments, uh, and no effect for uh, narrative of bilingualism for narrative macrostructure might make narrative macrostructure a kind of good tool for a bilingual assessment. Because you expect no effect of bilingualism uh, and you do find this effect of specific language impairment. Um, so because uh, people thought this is a good way to assess bilingual children, we also developed um, the multilingual uh, assessment tool within the COST project. Um, but a very nice design, I think. So there are four comparable stories, comparable in complexity of the story, um, which gives someone uh, who wants to test a bilingual child the possibility to test both languages. So use stories of similar complexity, but the stories are different. Uh, so you do not have a test effect, um, but you, you um, have a comparable measure in both languages. Um, it also allows you to use the model story procedure. <coughs> so what you see in many studies and narratives is that there is a wide variety in measures, so how people calculate, for instance, macrostructure, but there is also differences between studies in terms of the method that they use uh, to test the children. So studies tend to either use a telling procedure, where a child has to tell a story out of the blue, based on pictures, or children are asked to retell a story <coughs> where the test taker first tells a story and then the child has to retell the same story. The disadvantage of just telling is that children, they are often kind of reluctant to just tell a story. It's, it's a difficult task. Uh, and children tend to underperform if they have to do this. The difficulty with retelling is that it relies a lot on verbal short-term memory. Uh, and we've just seen that children with specific language impairment, they have difficulties with verbal short-term memory. Um, so using the retelling procedure also kind of underestimates the abilities of these children. What we do with the model story procedure is that first the test taker tells a story, a model story, friends a story about the cat. Then there are 10 comprehension questions about this story. And then the child has to tell a story himself uh, which is a story that is similar in complexity, but it's a different story. For instance, it's a story about uh, baby goats. So the child has a kind of example, the model story, but still ha uh, doesn't have to use verbal short-term memory because it's not a retelling task. So it's kind of taking the best of two worlds, I think. Um, so you have this model story procedure, uh, and what you do with the main task is you also look at both comprehension with comprehension questions, and you look at production. Um, the tool comes with a scoring protocol for macrostructure. And if you want to look at microstructure, you can do it as well. But there's not a, st a standardized protocol to do so. And also the macrostructure, it's uh, what we've just seen. It's probably much more relevant for assessing bilingual children because macrostructure is not affected by bilingualism, as microstructure is. So here's an example of one of those stories. It's the cat story. Um, it has three episodes. So each of the story has, uh, stories has three episodes. Uh, and an episode consists of a goal, an attempt, and an outcome. For instance, um, one of the episodes is about the cat and the butterfly. So uh, the goal of the cat is to catch the butterfly. Then the cat doesn't attempt. It leaps towards the butterfly. So that's the attempt. And then there is an outcome, which is uh, that the cat fails to do so, to catch the, bu the butterfly, and falls into a bush and gets hurt. So that's one, uh, one episode. The second episode is about the boy and the ball. So there is a ball, and he has a boy, and he has a ball in his hand, and the ball falls into the water. And then the goal of the boy is to get the ball out of the water. He doesn't attempt. He tries to get the ball. So that's the attempt. And then there is an outcome, which is that he achieves to get the ball, and he's happy. So again, a goal, attempt, outcome. And then there is the third episode, which is about the cat and the fish. So 
the goal of the cat is to get the fish because he's hungry. The attempt is that he grabs the fish. And then the outcome is that he eats the fish, so he achieves. Um, so each of the four stories has the same kind of complexity, consists of three episodes with a goal, an attempt, and an outcome, but with different characters and a different storyline. Um, what you can also see is that uh, if you look at the faces and expressions of the faces, uh, that it also um, allows or invites children to, use, to talk about the internal states of the characters. So you see, for instance, that the boy is unhappy when his ball falls into the water. Um, you see that, he, that he's happy when he has achieved to catch the ball. Um, so that, that invites children to use internal state terms. Um, it also allows you to look at inferences about the whole story because, for instance, at the end of the whole story, there is a question about whether or not you think that the boy will like the cat. In order to give a good answer, an appropriate, correct answer to this question, you have to kind of grasp the whole story and make inferences based on everything that happened in the story. So it allows you to look at complexity, goal, attempt, outcome sequences. Uh, it allows you to look at internal state terms, and it allows you to look at inferences. So all measures of macrostructure. Um, we again tested the four groups of children with this instrument. Um, the blue bars are the monolinguals, the green bars are the bilinguals. Um, what you can see um, kind of very quickly is that every time um, the bar for the LI children, both in the monolingual group and in the bilingual group, is lower than the bar for the typically developing children. So what these data showed was a clear effect of language impairment on all kind of different measures. So comprehension question was one measure. Uh, production, complexity was one measure, uh, showing an effect of language impairment and no effect of bilingualism. Comprehension of the, of the story that the child produced herself showed an effect of language impairment but no effect of bilingualism. And the use of internal state terms showed an effect of language impairment but no effect of bilingualism. So all the measures that we looked at, looked at uh, using this um, main task indicated an effect of language impairment and no effect of bilingualism. We also looked at the clinical value of this instrument. Um, and in order to do so, we kind of restructured a little bit the, uh, the components uh, that we looked at. Um, and in so doing, we uh, achieved um, a good clinical value for this test. So uh, both for the monolinguals and the bilingual sensitivity and specificity <coughs> Uh, between 80 and 90 percent, which is uh, kind of fair. Okay, summary. Um, in the first part of this presentation, um, I looked at a kind of double delays or therapy and combination of bilingualism and specific language impairment. Uh, what these data showed us was that bilingualism may be a risk for vocabulary of children with SLI, because vocabulary showed really a double delay <coughs> in the bilingual children with the language impairment. Um, however, it could have, so the bilingualism could have a positive effect on the processing mechanisms of the uh, bilingual children with SLI. Um, then I moved to the clinical part of this talk, uh, and what this showed was that um, a quasi-universal knowledge repetition task and a narrative uh, macrostructure task, so the main, um, can support the differential diagnosis uh, within both a monolingual and a bilingual uh, context uh, quite well. So they were uh, doing uh, quite well these two tasks in terms of clinical um, value. Okay, now I want to turn to, uh, so <laughs> how is this important for Barcelona? Um, it's important for, for bilingual children across the world, of course, but how is this relevant for Barcelona? Um, well, of course, there are many bilinguals here, multilinguals here, which means that there are also many bilingual children with a specific language impairment here. Um, does it mean that parents should avoid raising children uh, with SLI bilingual, uh, bilingually? Um, 
I think uh, what we know so far is that <coughs> children with specific language impairment, they can become proficient, relatively well proficient bilinguals. Um, but bilingualism doesn't cure their specific language impairment, so they will always have a specific language impairment. Um, in addition to this, um, I think parents, if their bilingualism is a kind of uh, social necessity, uh, because their family situation or their wider environment requires them to be bilingual, um, then it's not a choice. Uh, then children have to become bilingual. Uh, and we know that they can become proficient bilinguals, also children with specific language impairment. Um, and maybe uh, also for children with specific language <coughs> impairment, being bilingual, it gives them additional resources, so it may be an advantage even. Um, with respect to the diagnostic issues, um, <coughs> maybe the di I'm not sure, maybe the diagnostic issues do not arise that much for uh, Catalan Castilian bilingual children with SLI because they're kind of very balanced um, bilinguals and there's not so much of a diagnostic confound between <coughs> bilingualism and specific language impairment. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but it will definitely be rele relevant for the more exogenous type of bilingual children here. So the children raised in immigrant families who learn Spanish, uh, Castilian and Catalan as their second language. Um, so I think also for this context, those new tools uh, will be excellent. Okay, um, that's the end of my presentation and what I wanted to tell you about our research. Um, I didn't do this research on my own. Um, we tested many, many children. Uh, so these are only subsamples of all the children. We so we are following hundreds of children over a period of three years time. And they do a lot of tests. They are very patient, the children. Uh, so we test them every wave, two hours, two sessions. Um, so they do well. Uh, so we're very thankful, grateful to the children, also the parents. Um, who, who help us with testing their children and the schools and the teachers. Uh, the Netherlands Organi Organization for Scientific Research for providing funding for this research, which is important. Um, the Royal Dutch Cantalis and the Royal Dutch Aarhus Group, which are the kind of overarching organizations for special education in the Netherlands for children with speech and language problems. We have 20 research assistants testing all these children, uh, traveling around the whole country testing children, um, so we can't uh, have these results without their help. Uh, and then also Tessel Borma, Mona Timmermeister, Paul Leesman, and Frank Weiner, so the core team members. Uh, they all helped with all this research. So, thank you. Thank you, Elma. And time to questions. Some questions. Gracias. Thank you for your very, very clear speech in two very difficult topics, especially when they interact, SLI and bilingualism. So you succeed on being very clear and very an excellent exhibition. I have a question about when you were talking about narratives and micro results. Okay. Did you? Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, count uh, in these narratives if the children make any code switching or borrowings as correct for your structure in micro structure, because maybe. If we are uh, grading the children about one language or another, mm -hmm. we are not getting the core pr uh, processing. And maybe if we are uh, studying these children with their language, which is a mixture of both languages, maybe we will not uh, see those results as very being weaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so your question is, is whether we looked at code switching when we analyzed these narratives together. Uh, together. Um, we, in those data, we did not really look at code switching, but we also didn't have to do, uh, to do this because uh, these were narratives that they told in Dutch and they, I think they hardly ever or maybe never code switched uh, in this situation. We also have narratives of, uh, of children in their first language, 
Um, and what I do know, so what the research assistants told me, is that they do code switch. So the Turkish children, for instance, they do use Dutch words when they tell um, stories in Turkish. So when we start to analyze the Turkish narratives, for instance, we do have to think about what to do with code switching. Um, yeah, but these they didn't know, but they also didn't code switch. Alguna pregunta más? Si alguna vol fer en català o en castellà, intentarem traduir-la, vull dir que aprofiteu. Ah, no, perdó. Sí. She's asking if, if the bilingual children um, start to be bilingual in the family context or in the other sc school. Uh -huh. um, these are children, um, so in the typically developing sample, these were all either Moroccan families, children raised in Moroccan families, uh, immigrated from Morocco to the Netherlands, or Turkish. Uh, they heard Turkish or Moroccan or Berber languages in the home context. Uh, so uh, that's where they learned their, their first language. And they learned Dutch, sometimes through siblings, um, through preschool, uh, daycare, uh, and most of all through elementary school, which starts at the age of four in the Netherlands. There was a difference, um, uh, there is a difference, uh, which is an interesting difference between the Moroccan population in the Netherlands and the Turkish population in the Netherlands. Uh, what we know about the, the Berber, uh, the Moroccans, <coughs> Uh, who speak a Berber language, they tend to value their language quite low. Uh, it's a, not a written language, it's an oral language. Um, and what we see in, this, in the households of the Moroccan families, of the, of the Moroccan children, there's a lot of Dutch used. Uh, so there's a lot of language loss uh, in terms of the first language, much more than in the Turkish families. <coughs> so the Turkish people, they kind of value their first language high and they want to give this language to the children. <laughs> Um, so what we see in the Turkish children is that they are, when they go to elementary school, they have more of a delay in Dutch compared to the Moroccan children who hear more Dutch at home compared to the Turkish children. Um, the SLI sample was a mixture of all kinds of different languages, but these were all children who heard at home a language which was different from Dutch. So they learned the first language at home through their parents uh, and a second language either preschool, <coughs> school, elementary school. More questions? Um, I, I, want, I, I have one question that is so common here. It's um, here uh, we are a bilingual uh, society. So when we have uh, children with SLAI, it's so common here the, the language at the school is immersion in Catalan, so it, it doesn't matter the, your, your mother language, so the, the language or the structure at the school is, is, is always Catalan. So it's so common that the, where, um, where we diagnose an SLI, um, uh, some speech and language therapists uh, um, say that it, it would be better if uh, they only learn the first language, not, not uh, immersion in Catalan if, if uh, the, the child is, uh, um, the, 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 uh, his language, um, um, a mother language is uh, Spanish, or even that they don't uh, learn uh, English. So there, there is a debate if, if it's uh, better than they learn all the languages, English, uh, um, Catalan or uh, Spanish, or is better than they only learn the, the first language, the mother language. So what do you think about it? So these are children who have, who learn Catalan at school, yeah. uh, have a different language at home. Yes. For instance, uh, Chinese. Chinese or Spanish, yeah, yeah but Chinese, <laughs> Moroccan, <laughs> we have a lot of variety, <laughs> but... but it, mm -hmm. And they learn Catalan at school. Uh -huh. And then there's a debate about whether these children also should learn English at school. Yes. Right? It's, uh, because Catalan is already the second language, and it's the language of education. Exactly. So these children, when they go to elementary school, they have a kind of double task. Uh -huh. They have to learn Catalan, and they also have to learn in Catalan. Uh -huh. uh, so they have to learn math in Catalan, for instance. Exactly. So they have a double task, uh, which is a difficult task. Um, and the question is whether um, we should give these children 
again another task and also teach them English or not? Yes, the question is, well, uh, is, is good that we, we teach English? Uh -huh. Or in the case, the, the main case is uh, here there is a uh, half of the population that the, the mother language is Spanish and the other, the other half is, is Catalan. So uh -huh. uh, imagine that there is a, a child that is diagnosed uh, with, uh, children with SLI uh -huh. and is Spanish, uh -huh. the, the mother language. And uh -huh. what is better, that they uh, start uh, the, the school with immersion or, or, or um, it would be better that they, uh, um, the language at the school for, for, for him was uh, Spanish? Uh -huh. This is the question. Yeah. Um, hmm. I'm not sure what would be better. <laughs> it's a hard question to 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 answer. Um, what I I do know from so I've been doing research together with Joan Paradis in uh, in Canada, um, and we looked at effects of of age of onset. So. Um, is it better for children to start at an early age with their second language or at a somewhat later age? Um, what we found was that for children with specific language impairment, they, for them it kind of helped if they were a little bit older when they learned uh, a second language, which was in this case English. Um, so probably it helped the, these children to kind of first uh, acquire more or more uh, stronger linguistic representations, more knowledge about one language uh, before they started to, new, to, to learn a new language. Uh, it might also have helped these children that they are cognitively a little bit more mature when they're older, uh, which may have helped them to learn a second language. Um, so what this tells you is that for children with specific language impairment, um, if you have the choice of, of um, uh, raising them or having them bilingual, um, it might be beneficial maybe to not start as early, but start a little bit later maybe. Um, so I think in terms of education, I can imagine that these children, well, the same story may hold, maybe not start very early, maybe st first start with one language until they're kind of comfortable in that language, uh, and then maybe start a new language, if you have the choice, uh, because there are many bilingual situations in which you do not have a choice. <coughs> yeah, but it's a topic that so, um, there is now the last couple of years, there's much more research about bilingualism and specific language impairment, but there are still many things that we do not know. And there is both in specific language impairment and in bilingualism a lot of variation in heterogeneity. So it's very difficult to kind of give a general answer to the question. Uh, so you have to look at each different child, each different family situation, uh, school situation, in order to really decide is it good for this child to become bilingual. Thank you. Last call. One question more. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, we have a very difficult situation. We are not. I am not talking about SLI now, but just bilingually. That is, the parents that are more adapted to Catalonia or to uh, other places, because I know the situation. They tend to talk in the uh, in the language of the school or the society to the children. But this language is really not at the level of proficiency. Then we have a question that is very difficult because you, you have against two very important questions, the level of the language and the integration in society. So what do you think about this interaction, which is very difficult sometimes because you like the families talking in Catalan, for example, but they are Catalan, it's really hurting the level of proficiency of the Catalan in the child. Yeah. So what do you think about this conflict that yeah. we have. Yeah, I think it's a conflict that is, it's also in the Netherlands, uh, an issue, it's a debate. So it's a debate with respect to, to uh, families that migrated to the Netherlands, should they speak Dutch to their children or shouldn't they speak Dutch? Uh, and should they speak Dutch to the children is that if their Dutch is not fluent because it might not be good for the Dutch development of these children. Um, I think it's the most important thing for all parents is kind of to provide your child with a rich language environment, regardless of which language it is. Um, so if as a parent you are more comfortable in your first language, in your home language, then please use this language when speaking to a child and do not start to use a language that you're not comfortable with because it will affect the environment, the, the language environment that you provide for your child. You will use shorter sentences, give less explanations, um, well, 
it will affect uh, how you will communicate with the child. Um, so I would always tell a parent, so please use the language that you're most comfortable with. Um, and do not use the, the language of the educational system if, that's, if you're not feeling comfortable in this language. Um, what we do, so we, ha um, what we sometimes do, there is an intervention uh, that we used uh, for Turkish mothers in the Netherlands with low level of education. Uh, and it was kind of aiming at uh, learning those mothers to kind of communicate with their children in Turkish, their first language, but in a um, kind of helping them to, to provide in Turkish a more rich language environment for the children. So using kind of different uh, ways to communicate with your child, ask different kind of questions, um, ask questions that a child, uh, that invite a child to kind of explain more. <coughs> so that these children in their first language, Turkish, um, kind of get more used to the type of academic language that is used at the school. So in their first language, they um, are kind of more adapted to the type of language that is used in the school in Dutch. So they can use this kind of knowledge that they have learned in the first language also at school that helps them too. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. If there is another question, thank you for coming. Gracias por venir, gracias por participar lo que están en, viéndonos en streaming y, y yo, gracias a todos y buen, buen, buen vespre. <laughs>